think we'll just begin. Um, teleportation is a project that started in 2017 and consisted of two field trips, three exhibitions, and a final presentation event. And uh, during this talk, I will use the chronolog chronology of the project to connect some of the many references and reflections that have come up during my work with the project. Uh, I want to start with uh, what I consider the nexus of the project, uh, which is the exhibition Teleportation 3, which I'm sure some of you have seen. Uh, this was a large-scale immersive installation in Tornsalen at Code 4, dominated by total darkness and designed to be explored by a single visitor at the time. Uh, during the exhibition period, uh, I asked some of the visitors to wear microphones while inside the installation and describe it in real time. So go I in. Look at what for me. Ah, oh, help me. Okay. Jeg kan ikke se hendene mine. Det lukter litt maling. Og det er trangt. Nå holder jeg meg an i meg begge. På begge sider og ekko. Jeg har sluttet veggen. Så ble jeg helt stille fordi jeg vet ikke hva jeg ser. Hva skal jeg si da? Jeg føler jeg har funnet noe som har vært skjult i årtusener. Og at det beveger seg og lever litt. For meg var den... Det var en kroppslig opplevelse som var så sterk at den trigget vel alt som finnes av urbehov for kontroll og urbehov som menneske, noen sånne biologiske ting som gjorde at jeg følte meg... Jeg ble rett og slett redd. Så det var noen av de impresjonene som jeg gathered from the audience. Um, the image theorist uh, William Mitchell distinguishes between image and picture. The picture is a material support or physical medium of images. An image is an event or a happening rather than an object which always appears in material support. Photographs are a category of pictures that are everywhere in contemporary culture and the way that they interact with our notions of truth, fact and belief mean that it is important to constantly explore their, their ontology. In 2013, I made a work based on a tradition of Chinese landscape painting called Shan Shui. One of the things that made me interested in Shan Shui painting was its use of blank areas in the painting, voids. The voids of Shan Shui suggested the idea of non-existence and the unlimited space of nature, suggest, suge, suggesting the experience of entering into the great void of the cosmos and contemplating the nature of being. The word numinous has been used by thinkers such as uh, Rudolf Otto and Carl Jung and uh, Mirkia Eliad uh, to describe this sort of experience where we encounter the mystery of existence. In Shan Shui, this notion is located within nature, in the flow of the cosmos itself, rather than in the imaginary existence of a god that is located outside of the universe. And these types of paintings were some kind, sometimes uh, presented as so-called hand scrolls, 
where the viewer rolls the painting out on a flat surface one section at a time. This format renders the painting tactile. Instead of standing at a distance and passively observing it, the viewer affects an unfolding of the picture. We become engaged in what is called moving viewpoint. When we traverse along the scroll, the image as a totality is not experienced as converging on a single static point in the distance. <clears throat> um, that idea of a stationary viewpoint and a, um, uh, uh, a focal point in the distance is related to what we call linear perspective. Linear perspective is a technique for creating an illusion of three-dimensional depth on a flat surface or canvas by means of structuring the picture around a single vanishing point. This technique was based on the idea of a horizon as an abstract, flat, horizontal line. In uh, History of the Panorama, uh, Stephen Ottoman outlines how the, how the idea of the horizon first occurred in scientific contexts as part of a mathematical construction, a cool, unobstructed view of things, unclouded by subjectivity or physical frailty. Um, the discovery and use of the horizon as a tool for navigation at sea and linear perspective to create illusions of space reflects the historical experience that the known world is contained within the horizon and the unknown world begins beyond it and that both worlds can and should be explored. Linear perspective is a simulation of the way that an eye, the lenses that our bodies use to perceive the world visually, projects an image onto the retina. But the observer that linear perspective simulates is a detached and stationary observer, an observer outside of the situation, one that doesn't move and that all the elements in the picture are oriented towards. This sort of observer is a theoretical uh, construction because the way that the eyes give us the world in actual lived experience is structured by our shifting attention in time, our ability to focus on specific objects, the dynamic nature of the eyes positioned in a body that also moves, touches, tastes, has dreams and memories, and so on. Vision is a dynamic, always embodied process, surrounded by a horizon of subjectivity. <clears throat> Linear perspective has been seen as part of, a, of a Western civilization's development of a rationalistic, utilitarian, monotheistic, and abstracted view on the world. The same scientific developments, the developments that led to the development of linear perspective led to modern techniques of navigation at sea, and as a consequence, the discovery of other peoples and their lands. These became resources for Western men to exploit through colonial exploitation and the advent of a capitalist economy. The emergence of modern technology was part of this history, and the camera and the photograph radicalized the process of abstracting from the embodied situatedness of vision by deliver, delivering an even more perfect simulation of the way uh, that the eye focuses the world. Claire Bishop, in the context of describing how feminist concerns, concerns were part of the development of installation art, describes how installation art, by placing the viewer in a more engaged position vis-a-vis -vis the artwork, could function as an emancipatory tool, placing aesthetic experience closer to what we, uh, how we experience actual lived perception, where the viewer is never able to take in the whole aesthetic situation at once. Uh, this forces the viewer, installation art, fo forces the viewer to take shifting standpoints and doesn't allow the viewer to become fixated in a position of mastery before the scene depicted and, by extension, the world. Can photographic image-making processes carry with them a seed to break away from the fixated, detached viewpoint of linear perspective and a fixated viewpoint. The result of my work with uh, uh, Shan Shui and Hand Scrolls 
uh, was uh, this work that I'm showing here, uh, where I photo uh, presented photographic material in a somewhat unusual physical format, intended to bring attention to its nature as not only a visual rep representation, uh, but as an object to the touch, and an interactive experience that reflected on its own materiality and status as a picture. When unfolding the picture, the viewer gets to encounter a situation uh, where there is something hidden that through their physical engagement will become progressively revealed to their senses. Uh, the idea of making a tactile, interactive photo work like this was inspired by the philosophy of uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And one of Merleau-Ponty's key claims is that we must understand perception as always embodied, always contingent on us being physically present in a matrix of circumstances that determines how and what we perceive. Perception always takes place in our lived experience of the world uh, as organic bodies. By using the hand scroll as what Mitchell calls a meta-picture, reflecting on its own ontology as picture, I could bring attention to how pictures are not only contingent on their depicted subject, but make up their own class of objects. Photographs can bring into our perceptual field something at a different location, from a different time, without actually being there. At the same time, does the presence of the picture as an object anchor us in the here and now? And the perceptual experience becomes paradoxical. We are both here and there, both now and then, but the nexus of this experience is the lived body that puts us in a particular situation. This paradoxical nature of photographs as objects of perception is the reason that I decided to give my artistic research project the title Teleportation. In the same way as our eyes and ears enable our body to extend into space and engage with objects far away in the distance, not available to the touch, the photograph allows for the appearance of even more distant, even, and even seemingly invisible objects to enter into our perceptual field. Seen in this way, photographs act as a kind of teleportation devices. What could I learn from experimenting with the idea of photographic representation as teleportation, exaggerating or undermining it? Could I bring the photographic experience closer to the lived body? To begin with, I wanted to find more ways of materializing photographs as objects in a way that could expose their underlying technical structure. Um, in this work, titled .jpg, JPEG, uh, the artist uh, Jacob Riddle uh, has uh, used the digital, digital code of a digital photograph and manifested it in different formats. Among them, a printer that prints the entire digital code on standard paper, as well as the shredded remains of those prints. In this work, Riddle has sidestepped the ordinary process that leads to the formation of a photograph as a screen or a print and instead presented us with the underlying mechanics of that process. The information that this leads to the formation of the photograph. At the foundation of the teleportation project has been what I called photo objects. Uh, these are a kind of hybrids of photographs, relief and sculpture. And here I wanted to perform a similar operation to expose a digital structure underlying the production process of a digital photograph, but contrary to Riddle's work, let it interact with and augment the iconic qualities that we usually associate with photographs, what makes us recognize the image content. Focus stacking is a process meant to overcome 
optical limitations of a camera lens and to produce an image where all parts of the subject are in perfect focus. In a similar act of interruption, uh, I extracted printed image layers that could then be glued on top of each other. And the result was a dense paper object with a surface that slightly augmented the volume of the photographed object and also made the object attract the touch of the viewers who often would uh, sit down or lie down on the floor to examine the objects with their fingers. In the exhibition, there is always something more important by Marielle Neudecker from 2012. She had included a sculpture created on a research trip to Greenland, where a slice of an iceberg had been scanned and 3D printed and converted into a sculpture in a, in a human scale, corresponding to the size of an average door frame. The mapping and an accurate uh, recreation of the object, the slicing and cropping of the natural form, and its transpos transposition into the human environment of the gallery, points to commonalities with photographic processes. These processes, the cutting away of content, of uh, context, are just as much about what is unseen as what is seen, and reflects the transformation that raw materials go through when converted into artworks. Neudecker deliberately uses the iceberg as a cliché to create an atmosphere of the sublime, the experience of encountering the overwhelming forces and scale of nature, only to immediately deconstruct it by ironically reducing the iceberg to a human scale, implying human domination of nature, human dominion over nature, a power so ubiquitous that it becomes hard to even talk about nature as a meaningful concept anymore. To produce my photo objects, I wanted to explore what would happen if I tried to circumvent this idea that the natural has disappeared. A thought experiment to see if such an approach would take me to somewhere unexpected, a distant location where I could experiment with different ideas of exploration and mapping, and from which I could work with the idea of phot photography and teleportation. I decided to locate a recent volcanic eruption where molten lava that had been hidden deep inside the earth beyond the human world had, recent, had recently come out of the ground. When looking at my hand, you see the front of it. This is what the philosopher Gilles Deleuze calls the actual. The back of my hand is also part of reality, but to you, it's what Deleuze calls the virtual. It's not present to me in the same way as the front, it's not present to you in the same way as the front of my hand. When I turn it, the virtual converges into the actual, and the actual, the front of the hand, recedes into the virtual. This means that the virtual and the actual are not separate, they form a continuum. And reality, at least in our experience of it, is a constant weaving between the virtual and the actual. A volcano and a photograph can be seen as similar processes where the virtual, um, that which is real but not present, becomes actualized. It becomes revealed. If we, if we were to travel back in time and could ask the uh, primates that make up our ancestors, what would, we, what would you need to evolve? They would most likely respond that they would want a longer tail, perhaps with a hand on it, stronger nails, more muscles, and so on. They would probably not even think of the idea of language. They saw their future in light of their current situation and needs, without taking into consideration the unexpected virtualities that might unfold. When, lang when language did develop, we can imagine that our ancestors played with the sounds they could make, and eventually language and abstractions appeared. It's quite possible that singing, music, art developed before language. 
So therefore, the way we discover new knowledge, new skills, new worlds, is by throwing the world we live in around, exploring it from within. And uh, this is what we do in artistic research. And uh, it could be seen as similar to what uh, Oslo Nyrnes has described in her essay, Lighting from the Side. Artistic research is the practice of ex exploring a field from within, trying to develop a language to describe things that one does not yet know. As a researcher, I have had to set things in motion, see where they take me, and then respond to the situations I encounter and the results of my works. The lava field that I located uh, was the result of a fissure eruption in 2014 and formed a large horizontal lava field on a vast sand plain in the middle of the Icelandic highland desert. This is within a national park and uh, the area is completely devoid of civilization, um, except for a few roads. The experience of traveling to this site and being alone in the presence of the monumental lava field in the desolate Icelandic lands landscape was an overwhelming experience for me. I found that I could not approach this as an ordinary photographer. It wouldn't make sense because everything was uniform and the same, and at the same time different. Pointing my camera at one rock would just make as much sense as pointing it at another rock. As mentioned in relation to Marielle Neudecker, the physical reduction of such landscapes to fit into gallery spaces can reduce such sublime encounters with the actual site and keep the viewer at a distance. The land art artists in the 1960s wanted to circumvent the commercial agenda of uh, art galleries. They would leave uh, big cities like New York and travel to the west to untouched landscapes of, uh, uh, of the desert and produce land, uh, artworks in the form of large-scale interventions in the landscape and the earth itself. Um, seen, for example, here with uh, Michael Heiser's uh, uh, double negative. In the words of Lucy Lippard, uh, these works functioned as focal points in the vast landscape, or to give us views of the cosmos, to connect the places we stand with places we will never stand. Um, but since most viewers would encounter this kind of work through photo documentation, there is a distance built into the work. And Lucy Lippard has critiqued and likened the practice of land artists who often did not take into account the local inhabitants, the ecology or history of the sites that they transformed with their work as a kind of artistic colonization. Um, the way that the land artists worked with and transformed landscaped, landscapes based in romantic and detached notions of the timeless, the sublime and thus ahistorical landscape was done in a time different from ours, in the 60s. Today, the impact of colonialism and ecological devastation is charged with a completely different sense of urgency. And this is something we see re reflected in, for example, the main exhibition at uh, the Venice Biennale this year. I've had to ask myself whether such a critique uh, as Lippard uh, performs toward land art would be relevant vis-a-vis -vis my project. After all, in initial project formulations, the project was influenced by precisely the distance that many land art works, works would set up, in particular Robert Smithson's non-sites. <clears throat> in the first exhibition, I underscored this notion of distance. But I also acknowledged the singularity of the site by naming uh, each piece by using uh, their GPS co uh, position um, coordinates on the lava field. An important difference was that when working photogra with photography, I was not really altering the landscape or leaving significant traces. Part of Lippert's critique is that land art created its own kind of tourism, which in turn 
in turn creates incentives to conserve those landscapes as museums rather than living and changing sites. In Iceland, a sing similar they have a similar challenge with tourism which has emerged due to large movie productions using natural sites there as filming locations. But actually, the Icelandic authorities appreciated my comparatively small-scale, non-intrusive approach to the work, and they actively facilitated and supported the project. Uh, interestingly, this concern for tourism led me to change the project, since the authorities in Iceland set as a condition, condition for allowing me access to the lava field that I in fact stopped using GPS coordinates uh, as references to the sites precisely to prevent this type of tourism that was related to land art and the famous lo movie locations. And this meant that the connection to the site in Iceland became less, less visible in the works ultimately disappearing completely toward the end of the project. For Olafur Eliasson's uh, work, Ice Watch, from 2014, he excavated 12 ice blocks from a glacier in Greenland to be displayed as a melting uh, clock face on the ground in front of Tate Modern, uh, meant to inspire climate action. And the work was also shown in the climate conference in uh, Copenhagen. Artist and author Natalie Lobles considered such art con considers such as art projects as displaying ecology without actually initiating or performing different patterns of action. Natalie Lobles con contrasts such projects to art that performs ecologically minded action. Uh, with regard to this, she refers to the Fluxus artists who saw any moment of life as carrying the potential for being an art, play, art piece, essentially uh, seeking to blur the boundary between art and life. And in that way, smaller actions in the everyday can also be artistic responses to ecological crisis. We could perhaps place my project at some place between these two different positions. Contrary to land art artists and Eliasson, I didn't make alterations to the landscape. But on the other hand, my project did not really involve Iceland as such or its history. There were aspects of uh, the dissemination of my work where I somewhat ironically staged myself in the role of an explorer. But I think this should be regarded as more in the context of disseminating my project as re artistic research rather than actions meant as uh, artistic statements. I would regard the relatively small scale of my field trips as closer in impact to the practice of scientists rather than colonization. The institutionalized practice of artistic research can initiate ethical considerations in, rela in relation to artistic practice or individual works, and whether such reflection is also included in the artworks themselves becomes an artistic decision to be made in each uh, singular project. In conclusion, to work with the abstraction of landscapes is not as straightforward as it was in the 60s, which places more responsibility on artistic researchers to be mindful of what impact one has, to cooperate with the stewards of the sites one works at, and, how, and also consider how uh, the work eventually gets contextualized. So the photo objects that I produced uh, from my field trips in Iceland formed a constant over three successive exhibitions. The first two exhibitions can be seen as experimentational situations where I could observe how the objects functioned in the space by manipulating the context that the viewer uh, encountered the photo objects in. Um, teleportation 2 
uh, provide an, an occasion for building a custom architecture and lighting setup around the works. And in this exhibition, the objects were placed on the floor, literally reflecting the way that lava spread out over the landscape. Soft lighting made the surfaces of the space blend into, the, into each other, causing viewers to characterize it as reminiscent of laboratories, spaces of worship, science fiction aesthetics, or uh, the virtual spaces of 3D computer software. Uh, my photo objects, by means of the layering technique, reveals in material form the computations leading up to their manif manifestation from um, the digital process. And this could be seen as reflected in the idea of replicating uh, digital white non-space in the material form of the, of the installation architecture. Um, with Teleportation 2, I experiment, also experimented with how I could make the documentary uh, and the fictional interact by including material from the field trips in the form of a video showing the drive up to the lava field outside the exhibition space. I fed the rumbling sounds from the car from the, uh, from the video into the exhibition space through two subwoofer speakers that produced a low frequency drone. As a result of all but the lowest frequencies of the recording being discarded uh, by the filter in the speakers. Transforming the lava rocks into photo objects could be seen as an abstraction process involving cropping and isolation of objects similar to what uh, Marielle Neudecker did with the iceberg in her uh, installation. And the way that the speakers discarded of the high frequencies in the audio spectrum, and by doing so, made the motor hum from the car less recognizable, could be seen as reflecting a similar act of abstraction and reduction. Low frequency sounds can also be dis detected at volcanoes and can predict an eruption. But they're also present in organ pipes in churches. And some such organ, organ pipes are so large that they emit sound waves below the audible spectrum, called infrasound. In her research project, Infrasonic, Haunted Music, the organist Sarah Anglis has shown that, much infras that such infrasound can induce weird and uncanny emotional re reactions in test subjects, and of course used in symbolic set settings such as a church, may contribute to a numinous response an ambivalent feeling of fear, awe, and euphoria. In the study Spirituality in Contemporary Art, the artist and theorist Yang Gu Yun describes how he uh, has an experience of, of uh, actual fear in uh, Anthony Gormley's uh, vapor installation, Blind Light, shown at the Haywood Gallery in uh, 2007. It can be described, described as an ambiguous and complex feeling, creating both reluctance and curiosity simultaneously. However, when I entered the glass room with other members of the public, I did not experience the same emotions as I did alone. And I had a similar emotional response to the experience of my exhibition, in particular in the dark liminal space surrounding the white uh, space and the structure that we built in the gallery. But this experience uh, was when alone, and I noticed that uh, there was a profound difference from being alone in the exhibition and when someone else would enter, uh, which completely changed the experience from a more introspective and contemplative one to a social situation. Uh, and I found that this deflection from the awareness of the subtleties of the material situation and the potential for an introspective response in the viewer uh, made me decide that uh, the next exhibition would be for a single uh, visitor at a time. For the next show, I also wanted to shift the relation between viewer uh, and their position relative to the photo objects from looking down on them <coughs> to being surrounded. 
In her article, In Free Fall, a thought experiment on vertical perspective, Hito Style discusses the notion that in the current historical moment, we cannot assume any stable ground in which to anchor metaphysical claims or foundational political myths. She uses the analogy of experiencing a sense of floating when one is actually free-falling at great heights. For example, when you parachute. This state of floating is reflected in an increased pro proliferation of aerial views from above, where the viewing subject is assumed to hover over a stable ground. But as she explains, this ground just as a stable position of the observer in linear perspective ends up being a construction, since it does, since it does not really exist in the first place. Stell characterizes the assumed God's eye view from above, typically exemplified by a view from a satellite, as a radicalization of the detached and constructed viewing subject of linear perspective. But she also identifies both these positions um, as positions that carry within them the seed of their own downfall. Ultimately, Hito Stell sees an emancipatory potential in the many ways of creating images that exist simultaneously today, from 3D animation technology to the way cinematic space is twisted and turned into impossible, multiple collaged perspectives. She writes that the new tools of vision may also serve to express and even alter the contemporary conditions of di disruption and disorientation. The tyranny of the photographic lens, cursed by the promise of its in indexical rea relation to reality, has given way to hyperreal representations. Not of space as it is, but of space as we can make it, for better or worse. Uh, Trevor, Trevor Paglen is an artist and photographer who has modified telescopes to be able to photograph military installations in the desert. Here, literally, the apparatus contro controlling the military surveillance satellites is pu put in the position of the observed. Um, and uh, Trevor Paglen has also photographed internet cables that run along the bottom of the oceans. These cables manifest how the presence of the digital is not just a disembodied, dis distanced phenomenon in cyberspace, but a physical reality that we are immersed in. Immersed in. Uh, the artist James Bridle, in his book The New Dark Age, Technology at the End of the Future, describes how the first computers were mechanical systems that filled rooms that the technicians could walk around in and observe, observe the physical movements and noises of relays and other parts of the computer. Uh, today, computer technology has grown to fill the whole globe with satellites, cables, and power-consuming server parks. We are not only immersed in the digital, digital space of the internet, we are, as we can see in Trevor, Trevor Paglen's pictures of cables, quite literally immersed in a global computer, which can be held accountable and explored as physical matter. All the billions of digital photographs that exist inside it also have an investment in material reality, and working with installation provided me with artistic tools and strategies that I could use to stage human perception as an interface where the digital and the biological intermingle. The third exhibition, Teleportation 3, uh, took place in Tornsalen at Coup de Fira and was dominated by total darkness. Darkness as a tool has been used by several artists for increasing the experience of immersion into an installation space. And uh, one example that some of you may remember is uh, Sandra Mohinga's Shadow of New Worlds that was shown at uh, Bergen Kunsthall in 2019, um, that, I, that I became quite inspired by. And uh, the human perceptual uh, system and our eyes' response to different light conditions has uh, been used also by several artists throughout history, 
Uh, for example, uh, James Turrell, who's, who's a known example of this, uh, and uh, Olaf Eliasson. In uh, Eliasson's work, uh, your afterimage exposed orange in brackets. The phenomenon of afterimage on the retina in the eye is used to produce an experience of perception itself by using a photographic principle, the exposure, to pro project an afterimage formation with the viewer's eye as the material support. This type of work puts the sensory apparatus of the, cent um, of the viewer in the center of the experience and creates an aesthetic experience in the liminality between outer stimuli and the response in the perceptual system of the viewer. Eliasson underscores, underscores this centrality of the embodied viewer by uh, way of his titles, often beginning with your, in here for example, your blue afterimage. In traditional analog pho photography, a latent picture forms as a tension in the relations between the silver atoms on the film when exposed to light. Digitally, the process is similar. The picture exists as electromagnetic uh, tensions in a storage medium. Given the right conditions, by immersing the film uh, in an alkalic bath or by connecting the storage medium to a device that can interpret the electronic information in it, the latent picture can be conjured to our senses. The virtual folds into the actual. I found that I could use darkness and installation practice to reflect such uh, photographic processes of appearance. The artist and writer, Johanna Selinska, coming from a new materialist standpoint, has developed the idea of non-human photography. Non-human photography can be both photographs created by machines and without human agency. But she also proposes that non-human photography can involve photography understood as an inherent feature of how the world works. That means, for example, a fossil or a sunburn can be seen as photographic, as fixating an imprint. The lava field in Iceland could be a photograph by its fixating of a flow happening in time. Similarly, we could view the encounter between viewer and uh, teleportation three in terms of uh, other photographic processes, like those of exposure and development. Much like a camera, our eyes have an aperture, the pupil, that controls the amount of light that is allowed onto the retina. The retina, in that analogy, the retina corresponds to a film or a digital sensor that gets exposed to a focused image and in low light will slowly adapt to allow us to, give, uh, to have darkness vision. But this camera analogy of vision only goes so far because uh, impressions given to us by the eye are processed by the mind. The image that is formed in consciousness is not the result of a mechanical process, but the subjective process of embodied percep perception, as I explained. When entering the dark space of teleportation three, the conditions are not yet right for the situation to manifest to vision, but it is available to, to, to the touch. Now the touching hands become implicated in the experience of the photographic. By having vision tem temporarily blocked, uh, the experience of touch can become more pronounced and the space itself ever so slowly reveal themselves. In fact, now the viewer's perceptual apparatus has become a form of developer technology for the image that the installation as a whole manifests, corresponding to how photographic prints slowly appear in the darkroom. The totality of the situation forms an image space that takes place in the interaction between the viewer and their perceptual responses and the stimuli from the installation space. Many visitors describe this as an almost hallucin hallucinogenic uh, experience. So in this way, installation uh, can provide the opportunity of a decentering process, where the static viewer, uh, either at the focal point of central perspective, 
or hovering about, above ground is relocated to a position where the Im image has to be developed in the encounter between the body and the situation present to it, as described by uh, Merleau-Ponty. Such ideas could also be seen in relation to Donna Haraway's a cyborg manif uh, manifesto. Here, Haraway proposes that as humans, we are already cyborged, cyborgs. That is a kind of merger between the bi biological and the technological. For Haraway, the cyborg re represents a rejection of traditional boundaries between human and animal, human and machine, man or woman, or the physical and the non-physical. Oppositions that ultimately, ultimately lead to oppression, uh, that lead to oppression. And with the cyborg, Haraway wants to introduce a new ontology where imagination and material reality, nature and culture exist not as dichotomies, but as a dualism. Such an ontology, uh, such an ontology can open up to an ethics of cooperation and coexistence instead of conflict and exploitation. Uh, such ideas could have an emancipatory potential if we find ways of internalizing them at an individual level. I wanted Teleportation 3 to be a personal experience to each visitor, uh, which was one of the reasons why I decided that they would go in one by one. Cats and dogs are capable of hearing sounds at higher frequencies than the human ear can pick up, and technological instruments can pick up phenomena that lie beyond our perceptual capacity. And that has led us to being able to confirm speculative theories about, for example, the existence of black holes or the entanglements of particles on a quantum level through uh, indirect observation methods. That shows us that unexpected virtualities always lurk between the surface of things. And we can fold them into the actual, reveal them, by attuning ourselves to and playing with the world as we know it. Insisting on the direct corporal experience of the situation, by not allowing phones or cameras inside the space, and by not publishing documentation photos online, I was uh, was a way to gently ask the viewer to attune themselves to what can happen in the subtleties in the process of perception. Many visitors talked about how, their, how in their daily lives, saturated by information, there were few, if any, such situations where one can experience total darkness or silence. By contextualizing the per perceptual experience of Teleportation 3, by means of reference to sacral architecture, outer space, caves underground, and so on, I intended to suggest that the revelatory nature of tuning ourselves to the subtleties involved in perceptual experience can carry a potential for existential or even spiritual insight. But it was important that in the event that visitors had such responses, that space was given for it to be a spontaneous and personal experience, rather than a result of expectations projected from, uh, for example, a project description available on entry. <clears throat> Claire Bishop suggests that in dark installations, there is a sense of dissolution of the self. In darkness, space can appear infinite, and there is no proper placement because one does not have spatial coordinates to relate to, as one can in a space filled with light. The body loses sense of its boundaries and begins to coincide with the space. Uh, many uh, visitors, as you heard in the recording in the beginning, reported a literal sense of fear when entering into the situation. Ultimately, this experience of having to surrender to an overwhelming sensory experience in a state of not knowing, not being able to orient yourself, is what is often described as the moment of the sublime, and could be also a reflection of my own experience when trying to approach and work with the lava field in the landscape in Iceland. 
Um, so by not publishing pictures of the work or information about what would happen on the, in the exhibition online, I wanted to maximize this experience in combination with building anticipation. Such an approach has been used, for example, by Tino Segal, as well as uh, Edwina Larsen in her PhD project at Trondheim Art Academy of, uh, in 2018, which we see some pictures from here. Uh, her project is situated between visual art and theater, and she has many similar concerns with my project, relating to how situations activated by careful choreography of space, light and darkness, uh, and the viewer itself, can shape an aesthetic experience in the mind of the participant. Uh, in Edwin Larsen's work, uh, a single visitor uh, was in, at the time was instructed to show up at the private address where the guide would meet them and take them on a care, carefully planned performative journey through situation, situations constructed using total darkness in cellars in local houses in Levanger and Trondheim, um, where the space was being modulated by light projections and they also continued the walk through the streets of the city. Similarly, I wanted the visitors to discover their own personal responses to the unknowns of the situation, giving them a sense of being on a mission of discovery. But an important difference to uh, Larsen's work is that in my installation, the visitor was left on their own. There wasn't a, a guide guiding them. And this could be one reason why many of them reported that the encounter with the installation was beyond explanation, that you had to be there. <clears throat> um, so the way that the relation between viewer and photo object shifts from teleportation, the, the two first exhibitions, teleportation one and two, and then to teleportation three, from a detached uh, position from above to a more immersed one, can be s also be thought of illustrating a form of decentering process. Okay a kind of shift from a paradigm of transcendence to one of imminence. A move which places a stronger ethical responsibility on us to align ourselves, ourselves with the actual lived reality of material existence. As Donna Haraway describes, this is a reality that we share with non-human beings, and not just animals, but the earth and the cosmos as a whole. We can live in a more integrated and sustainable, sustainable way by align, aligning ourselves in this way, something that in indigenous peoples have done for thousands of years. The ecological crisis and the global inequalities that it exposes imbues such concerns with increasing ur urgency. <clears throat> to conclude the project, I developed a final presentation in which I took the logic of transmuting and abstracting the material to its final conclusion by completely omitting the photographic material and replacing it with a sound collage that included sounds and descriptions from visitors to uh, Teleportation 3 and my field trips. This sound collage was performed to a group of people in a completely darkened space, uh, actually this space. Um, and in this situation, the total, uh, the total elimination of visual uh, impressions meant that the sound collage could also be understood in terms of a photographic development process, but this time of mental images in each of the each of the viewer. And such mental images form in the mind from memories and personal association, and this con could maybe contribute to making the viewers in, uh, the viewers immersion into the project and my material even deeper. So, by this point in the project, um, the original subject matter of the lava field had been through several steps of removal from its original context. We could, uh, we could compare this process with Tauber Auerbach's work, Marble, from 2011. And here, a slab of marble was sanded down uh, step by step, and after each round of sanding, the remaining slab was scanned, 
Each scan became a page in a book that eventually took the form of the marble itself, which now had turned into dust particles as a result of the process of repre representing it. The, its representation had taken the place of the marble slab. And perhaps similar to this work, we could view the way that the lava rocks were transmuted through the different production processes in the teleportation project as abstracting the material, removing it from its uh, initial referent, the lava field. But the lava field is still there, and it never disappeared. It is through the process of rep representation and re-representation that the indexicality of the photo objects becomes polarized. So the perspectives that I have presented for you today have been through interpretations and uh, mostly in an analytical language. Through the work with the, uh, the project and the reflection text, I have found that ultimately, uh, showing and expressing such references, theories, and actions through artworks allow for a different order of complexity that can enable me to express concerns that may be ambiguous, subtle, paradoxical, and even self-contradictory. And I believe that this reflects that ultimately, the kind of knowledge that artistic research can provide involves making access accessible the way that we as artists grapple with complex phenomena and relationships by using our artistic tools and the forms of insight that can arise from lived embodied experience to put them up, each, to put them up against each other to play with them and to synthesize them in otherwise impossible ways. As such, I hope that I've been able, through my project, to play my small part in playing the world into new forms of being. Thank you. <laughs>